Okay, well, uh, um, good afternoon and uh, good morning to the folks in the United States. My talk is going to be about um, atrial fibrillation and um, for the most part, um, I am afraid, um, you know, um, I may not present uh, atrial flutter, but uh, most of the management approach is similar to atrial fibrillation. I may have a couple of slides at the end uh, you guys can, can have and uh, read it. Uh, so, <clears throat> Um, we go, I'm going to start with the definition, some classification, and uh, uh, pathophysiology and uh, management approach. I have also some cases uh, that I'm going to show you. Uh, also, I got some, some cases that I was consulted over the weekend uh, that I thought are interesting to show you on ECOS. Um, so, by definition, atrial fibrillation um, is a supraventricular arrhythmia characterized um, by, electro by low amplitude electrocardiographic baseline oscillations, or we call them the F waves. And the ventricular rate during F50 typically is 100 to 160 beat per minute. So uh, in any arrhythmia, when we talk about the rate, uh, always, uh, you know, we talk about the atrial rate and the ventricular rate. Uh, but in normal sinus rhythm, uh, basically because the rate is the same whether it's in the atrium and ventricle, we, some, uh, we are talking about the same rate. But in atrial fibrillation, you have the atrial rate and you have the ventricular rate. Uh, so in atrial fibrillation, the atrial rate is usually in the 400. Uh, you don't see it because uh, these are very small wavelets or sometimes what you see is flat line. So if you look at this EKG, this is what we call it normal EKG or normal sinus rhythm. What that means is you have P wave before the QRS. So this P wave is upright on, on lead to especially on lead to if you have upright P wave, that means it's sinus. The origin of the impulse is from the sinus node. But in atrial uh, fibrillation or the other arrhythmias, uh, the origin is not in the sinus node, but in the atrium. Uh, so if you see here on the EKG in atrial fibrillation, what you see is what we call it irregularly irregular. The R to R wave, the R to R wave, are irregular. So the distance between the R to R, R to R are uh, totally irregular. But in sinus rhythm, the R to R wave is regular. Uh, so once you see irregular R to R wave, the next thing you need to do is look at if you see P wave. If you don't see P wave, or if it's small oscillating or flat line, what you have is by definition atrial fibrillation. Uh, I suspect my colleague, uh, Dr. Mikias, uh, went over these basic EKGs. Uh, but if you see a regular R to R wave, there are three or four conditions that can give you a regular R to R wave. One is the common is atrial fibrillation. The second is multifocal atrial tachycardia. The third is um, normal sinus rhythm with premature atrial complexes. Uh, sometimes atrial flatter when you have variable block, you can have irregular R to R. But those are the three common items you have to look. Once you see irregular R to R, just go check if there are P waves. If you don't have P waves or the P waves are what we call them fibrillating, oscillating waves like this, what you have is atrial fibrillation. So looking at this EKG, um, can you hear me, Dr. Girma? Can you guys Yeah, we me? can. Uh, yeah. But you can so, up your voice a little bit, but we can hear you. <clears throat> yeah. So if you see this upper EKG, you have upright P wave, QRS. This is a normal EKG, normal sinus rhythm. If you see the lower uh, R to R are irregularly irregular, and you have oscillating uh, F waves or fibrillating waves. So this is atrial fibrillation. This is normal sinus. Like I said, there are two, three or four items, conditions, or arrhythmias that can give you a regular R to R wave. 
This is the commonest atrial fibrillation. If you see the R to R wave, um, you know, they are irregular. And if you see on the, uh, there is no any P wave, P wave. So this is atrial fibrillation. The second thing is, if you see this EKG, you have P waves, looks like P waves, but the P waves are different in shape. This P wave, this P wave, this P wave, they are indifferent in shape. And if you see the R to R, they are irregular. This is what we call it, multifocal atrial tachycardia. You see it in patients with um, COPD, COPD exacerbation, some of them on bronchodilators, on theophylline and so on. And the third one is, this is normal sinus rhythm. You see it, you have P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS, but this is premature. You have PS, is premature atrial complexes. In such cases, the R to R wave looks like irregular, but it's normal sinus with PS. So these are the three items you need to differentiate when you see irregularly irregular or irregular R to R um, EKG. So this is the first case, um, um, uh, uh, 80 years old, uh, white female patient with history of hypertension. Uh, she came in with shortness of breath, palpitation, and discom uh, chest discomfort, orthopenia, PND, and leg swelling. She had signs and symptoms of heart failure. This is the AKG. Um, and uh, basically uh, what you see is this is um, uh, uh, the R to R is irregular. You don't have any P waves, atrial fibrillation, a little bit complicated EKG. The patient also has. Uh, so, so Henok, do you want to give them a chance to say yeah, so I was what looking. it is? Okay. So, so we can go on the chat section and let's see from the audience. Um, if uh, a couple of pointers and stay on the, you know, stay on the EKG and maybe in the next 30 seconds or so, if there are any one of you guys can maybe um, point to Dr. Honok what you think it is. Yes. So there is the atrial fibrillation with left bundle branch block. Okay. What else can it be? So uh, where is the chat response? I don't see the... So if you hover down on your screen, you can see where it says chat. And if you click that, you'll see it. But I can read it for you. There's one response and it says, atrial fibrillation with left bundle branch block. And there's yeah, so... another one, another one that says, A, it is atrial fibrillation. Um, there's another one that agreed with the air fibrous left bundle branch, then another one that says atrial fibrillation yeah. was conduction block. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so uh, it's important to understand the reason is most of the supraventricular tachycardia, so either AFib, a flutter, or the AVN RTs, you have narrow complex uh, QRS, but on this one, you have looks like wide QRS. Sometimes it may confuse with ventricular tachycardia. But this is a fib with left bundle branch block. So it's, it's critical to understand, you know, um, the narrow complexes and wide complex tachycardia because the approach is different. So yeah, this is a fib with left bundle branch block. And um, uh, I'm going to show you. Um, So this is a echocardiogram. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know there is a severe uh, global hypokinesis of uh, you know the left ventricle. The left atrium is dilated. Uh, uh, so the patient, um, because she has a fused RVR, uh, she was started on uh, beta blockers and uh, also the dioxin and uh, we couldn't control um, the heart rate and we added actually IV cardism and uh, finally actually amiodarone. And uh, then uh, this is a mitral inflow Doppler. Uh, the reason I brought this uh, is uh, patients with diastolic dysfunction 
when they decompensate and show up in the AR, most of the time what makes them decompensate is tachycardia, any type of tachycardia, and the commonest is atrial fibrillation. And uh, I wanna show you why this is the mitral inflow Doppler in diastole, and this one we call it, uh, you know, uniphasic mitral inflow. Uh, so, talking about diastology and diastolic uh, feeling to the ventricle, I want you to pay attention to these two slides to understand why these patients with um, diastolic dysfunction, old age, hypertension, comes to the hospital with decompensated heart failure, especially when they develop tachycardia and AFib. And if you see the QRS from uh, this to this QRS, um, after the P wave, after the T wave is the diastole. In, in cardiac cycle, most of the time in the cardiac cycle, more than around two thirds of the cardiac cycle is the diastolic phase. So understand the diastolic phase is the filling phase of the ventricle. The mitral valve opens and the ventricle fits. So there are two filling waves here you see. The first wave, filling wave, we call it the E wave. What that means is once the mitral valve opens, the ventricle is relaxed and it sucks the blood. Most of the blood to the ventricle fills on the early phase. We call it rapid filling phase. And we call it the E phase. And the second wave is the atrial kick. The atrium contracts and fills the ventricle. And uh, in young people, most of the filling occurs, 80% of the blood to the ventricle fills during the rapid phase or the E phase. And about 20%, 20 to 30% by atrial kick, atrial phase. But when we get old, the contribution of the atrial kick, the atrial contraction increases by the age of 50, 60%, almost it becomes one to one. Now, coming back to the thing I showed you in atrial fibrillation, what happens is you lose the atrial kick. So only you have rapid feeling and you don't have atrial kick. That's why this patient gets decompensated and develops heart failure because you don't have the atrial kick, you lose the atrial kick. If you auscultate these patients, they don't have S4 because they don't have the atrial kick because of the FE, the atrium is not contracting. So it's very important to understand when these patients show up in the emergency room, the first thing you need to do is to control the heart rate because they need time to fill in the ventricle. Uh, so, um, can, can, so, this patient was on three, four drugs. Still, we couldn't control the heart rate. The heart rate was in the 120, 130, 150. And the patient had heart failure with pulmonary edema. And what's the other option we need to do on this patient? Uh, if you guys can respond. So other option as in medication or... Whatever well, therapy, okay. Yeah, so, so we, we have used every medication. So what, what's what, the other option? So the question is what next? What can we do? Okay, you guys here? So you can go in your chat section and um, maybe indicate. So there is here a cardioversion, cardioversion, couple of cardioversions here. Okay, I'm a, so I'm a surgeon, so I will say operate, but no. <laughs> Synchronized cardioversion. Uh, so, yeah, yes. so, so exactly what we need to do in these patients, you know, we use all the medicines we have. Patient is, you know, in heart failure. So the other option is cardioversion. Now, when we do cardioversion, the one thing we need to rule out is that the patient doesn't have clot in the left atrium. And before we do any cardioversion, if the patients were not anticoagulated for weeks, we do what we call a transesophageal echo. So this is TEE, we call it transesophageal. Basically, it's an echo. If you put the probe on the chest, we call it transthoracic echo. If you put the probe in the stomach, basically it's endoscopy. We go through the esophagus to the stomach and we look at the left atrium. Remember, the left atrium and the mitral valve are posterior structures. So sometimes it's very difficult to see from transthoracic, especially if you are looking for blood clot, 
you need to do transesophageal echo. You cannot see it from the transthoracic. So I will show you here. Um, so this is a TEE. Um, uh, so aortic valve, you see the aortic valve is three cusps. The aortic valve, we call it triliflet or tricuspid in a sense. So that's the normal aortic valve. If you have two cusps, we call it bicuspid aortic valve. So bicuspid aortic valve is the commonest cause of congenital abnormality. But if you see here, the aortic valve, this is, uh, okay, let me stop it and show you. Okay, so see these three cusps, that's the aortic valve. If you have two cusps, we call it bicuspid aortic valve. And uh, in the cardiology community, we call it this aortic valve, the Mercedes-Benz sign. If you see the Mercedes-Benz, Mercedes car at the back, that's what it looks like. So we call it the Mercedes-Benz sign because it's triliflet, tricusp. That's the normal aortic valve. This is a tricuspid valve, pulmonic valve, and uh, uh, this is a pulmonary artery. I'm going to show you the next one. Um, okay. So... If you have blood clot because of atrial fibrillation in the atrium, 90% of the blood clot is, there is one cul de sac, we call it left atrial appendage. Uh, this is the left atrial appendage here. You see this appendage. This is where usually the blood is stasis. If you're gonna find blood clot, this is where the area you have to look at in transesophageal echo. Sure enough, on this patient, you see, it's not well-organized thrombus, but you can see flagellated here coming out of uh, the left atrial appendage. So that's what you call it, the blood clot, thrombus in the left atrial appendage. That's why this clot is breaks off, goes through the carotid to the brain, and you get stroke. And the main, one of the main treatments for atrial fibrillation is of course, anticoagulation. The reason we anticoagulate is because these patients, they have blood clot in the left atrium, especially in the left atrial appendage. And so what do we do next? Any response? So Type in your is, thoughts, uh, answer. What do you want to do next? Now we have thrombus in the atrial appendage. And uh, Dr. Henock says cardioversion is contraindicated. We exactly. have maximized medical therapy. Exactly. So now we cannot do cardioversion. So we defer cardioversion. Uh, of course, the patient uh, took her like three, four days, you know, to control the heart rate and get out of the heart failure. Of course, she had some troponin elevation. We took her to the cat lab. She had some lesion in the circumflex and we stented. And uh, then no, I get I get no I get no answer. So I think you may have to go ahead and give the answer. Yeah, yeah. So we differ. We didn't do cardioversion. Basically, we didn't do cardioversion. Just uh, we maximized the medication. She waited uh, several days in the hospital, and then we discharged her with anticoagulation and uh, digoxin and. Uh, 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 you know, beta blocker, metoprolol, and cardizen. Okay. Yeah, a couple so, of uh, um, the audience have actually said heparin infusion, anticoagulation. Um, very true. That's the main, you know, when, when they are in the hospital, every patient with atrial fibrillation on heparin uh, infusion or lovonoxy can use, then you can switch them to oral anticoagulation with their comedin or the new uh, oral uh, zonox. Um, that's very true. So the second case, this is 89 years old, white male patient, history of hypertension, present with shortness of breath and palpitation. So if you guys can take and respond to this EKG. So in the meantime, um, Dr. Enoch, think about, uh, there was a, there's a question about ablation. So maybe you want to talk about it later yeah, we go, that, that's that's going to be at the end of the talk so okay, perfect we, we're going to have which one to ablate and so on so, so in the meantime a question what do you think this is another patient with shortness of breath and kg any thoughts type in into the chat section
any response? Um, so there is an ATL flutter response here. Um. Yeah, so like I say, look at the art R wave. It looks like regular. If you go, you see these waves, these are big waves. Actually, these are atrial flutter waves. So the difference between atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation from the origin of the arrhythmia. Um, in atrial flutter, they are macro reentry. They are big waves. You see the flutter waves. In atrial fibrillation, they are micro uh, wavelets. Uh, so this is atrial flutter. And um, uh, this patient also, uh, same thing, we went through beta blockers, uh, digoxin, cardism. Uh, couldn't control the heart rate and uh, uh, so again we did uh, transesophageal echo so this is the left atrial appendage you see there is no any thrombus and we went ahead and uh, did a synchronized cardioversion um, so this is EKG, uh, anybody can tell me about this EKG, can you respond? This is about uh, after uh, cardioversion. This is after cardioversion, what, what happened? Okay. No answers yet. Okay, so because it's simple, basically, patient is in sinus now. That's what the uh, aim yeah, the of the sinus, sinus rhythm. Yeah, yeah so, someone responded sinus rhythm. Yeah, so this is sinus. You see, lead to you have P wave TRS. So we cardioverted this patient uh, with uh, DC cardioversion and uh, we send him home with medication and the anticoagulation. Okay, this next two cases, uh, I was consulted over the weekend. Uh, I thought these are interesting, uh, f uh, you know, uh, cases, so I will share with you. Um, so this is a 50 years old white female patient uh, with no significant past medical history except some history of diverticulitis. She had a couple of votes in the past. She came with abdominal pain and palpitation and uh, I was consulted on her, uh, and this is the AKG. Any response? Okay, let's give uh, 30 seconds. What do you see on this EKG? What do you see on this EKG? 50-year-old with history of diverticulitis who comes with chest discomfort. And palpitation and palpitation. I don't know, I see those P waves in D2. Yeah, see. so, yeah, so. Sinus, it, there is a sinus yes. tachycardia answer here for you. Oh, oh, this is sinus rhythm. Uh, so just, uh, you have to see the big boxes if you have uh, more than three boxes between the R to R, basically it's less than 100 heart rate. So this is sinus rhythm, uh, but uh, she had palpitation. Uh, it was a surprise for her what we found. She came in for abdominal pain to see a surgeon, but uh, uh, let me show you. Uh, we did echocardiogram and uh, if you guys can respond what you see on this echo. I'm going to show you another picture. Uh, yeah. I think this, uh, even a non cardiologist like me, can see a mass there. Yeah. So I see, I see some responses. There is an atrial mass. There's, you know, some, you know, uh, there's a mass. Yeah, so there's that, definitely that, there's a mass there. You know? Yeah, so this is clear, I mean, you know, this is atrial mass. You see it, uh, and uh, this atrial mass is attached to the intraatrial septum. 
you see it's protruding through the mitral valve. Sometimes this mass, they can act like mitral stenosis. And uh, on further questioning the patient, actually she didn't know, but for some time, she feels something is dropping on her chest. These patients, they will tell you when they change position, there is something dropping in their chest. So basically this is what you call it, myxoma, atrial myxoma. And uh, she didn't know she had any cardiac issue. Uh, she didn't have much symptoms except some palpitation. So this is a transthoracic echo. I'm gonna show you uh, the transesophageal echo on her. Um, uh, so this is a Doppler across the mitral valve. Like I said, it acts like mitral stenosis. So you see there is gra gradient across the mitral valve about six millimeter of mercury. And uh, here is transesophageal echo. Just you're gonna see this impressive mass attached to the intraatrial septum. And uh, it's, it's pretty big mass. Um, uh, and uh, look at here. So you see this big mass the, on the top of, you know, pushing the mitral leaflets. Uh, fortunately, the mitral leaflets, there is no any damage to the mitral leaflets. There was not much MR. This is the anterior mitral leaflet, posterior mitral leaflet, aortic valve, this is the aortic root. You see a huge mass here. So this is a atrial myxoma. Uh, so this patient is going for a surgery tomorrow for resection and surgery. Uh, we did coronary angiogram on her. Uh, she has clean coronaries and uh, she is going for surgery. Just, I thought this is interesting and uh, to show you. Um, any questions on this? No. Maybe about, um, you know, five, four minutes if you have some more slides to share. Um, and, and then we can take some questions. So. How do you differentiate it from, from a big thrombus? Well, uh, first of all, uh, if you get thrombus, uh, the thrombus you get in the left atrium is in the left appendage. If you see this is well formed, it has a uh, stock attached to the intraatrial septum. Uh, actually, I can show you uh, here uh, where this mass is attached. Thrombus, you know, it's very difficult to have such big thrombus. You see, it's attached with stock to the intraatrial septum here and it's well organized. Uh, so, you know, this is a myxoma. I mean, you know, if you have, for that matter, if you have thrombus, that big thrombus, probably before uh, that gets that size, you're gonna have a lot of complication with stroke and, uh, you know, distal emboli everywhere. Uh, so, th do you this want is- to Do you want to stop here and take questions, Dr. Enoch, or? I have one more. Uh, yeah, let's finish and then. Yeah, so I have one more uh, case. Okay, so this is another patient who was consulted on Sunday, 69 years old, uh, history of hypertension, morbid obesity. She came in with worsening shortness of breath for a week. Uh, she visited her primary care physician. He thought she may have some upper respiratory tract infection, maybe pneumonia. He put her on some antibiotics, but she didn't get better and show up in our emergency room. And uh, we did some, some tests. Troponin was just borderline there, 0 0.1. BNP was elevated at 65. D-dimer 6.5. So if you can't take this EKG. Okay. So what is everybody thinking here? based on the short history and EKG that you see. So far, no takers. It looks like a trap letter, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, let's give uh, yeah so more. just, oh, let me go. So 15, if, 15 more seconds. Okay. So, but if you go to the, uh, look at the lead to, you have P waves here, you have P waves. So what you have is sinus, basically sinus tachycardia. 
sinus tachycardia, shortness of breath, elevated D-dimer. So what, what do you think? Of course, you know, uh, Dr. Girma spoke the other day, you know, the big items <laughs> you need to roll out in uh, chest pain, shortness of breath, you know. Uh, yeah, some uh, answers have come and there's a PE answer, for example, and uh, pericardial effusion possibility is raised. Okay, so I'm going to show you, yes, yeah, so this patient, uh, I will show you, uh, this is a CAT scan. Uh, like I said the other day, we are liberal on, the, on doing CT angiogram uh, at the, in the AR when patients present with uh, shortness of breath, chest pain. Uh, if you rule out acute coronary syndrome or if you are suspicious for other uh, either dissection or PE, we do CT angio in the emergency room. So this is CT angio on one of the cuts, but this patient has a PE, bilateral PE. You can see it here. She has feeling defect here on the distal uh, pulmonary artery. Uh, so she was short-winded. Her BNP was elevated, and uh, it's P. So what do we do next? Okay. So I'll go and show you um, why. So what do you do next other than anticoagulation is the question? Yeah, so uh, let me show this is the echocardiogram. Of course, we do echo on these patients. Uh, if you see, there is flattening of uh, the septum here. And this is the RV. The RV is generous. And uh, I'm going to show you. And uh, this is another view of the echo. If you see, the RV is bigger than the LV. Normally, the left ventricle is bigger than the RV. So in patients who has PE, what we do is when you do the echo, you look for RV strain. What that means is you measure the RV, you measure the LV, you do the ratio. So if your ratio is above one, we have what we call it RV strain. These are the patients who need uh, some more treatment in addition to anticoagulation. Of course, any patient with PE, they need to be on heparin or low molecular heparin. But uh, then we have to risk, risk stratify the patients, whether they are high risk with massive PE, saddle PE, when patients they present with hypoxia, hypotension, or some of the patients, uh, they are hemodynamically stable, but they have RV strain. So those are the patients we become also aggressive in treating these patients in addition to anticoagulation. So what do you think we need to do next? There is uh, already an answer that says thrombolytics. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so these are the patients uh, who need thrombolysis. Okay, these are the patients who need to thrombolyze. They have big uh, um, clot, could be in the main pulmonary artery or bilateral in the pulmonary arteries. They have RV strain, they develop acute core pulmonary. These patients, you know, they, they decompensate easily. So we have to use thrombolytics. Now the question is, uh, the dreaded complication of thrombolytics, as you know, is uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So we have to weigh the benefits and the dreaded complications of thrombolytics. Uh, of course, uh, you know, um, still we can use thrombolytics, but in our setting, what we do is, um, I will show you. Um, okay. So look at uh, this. Uh, so if you see the RV, the RV free wall is hypokinetic, it's not moving. Okay. So once we saw this echo, uh, this is kind of a medical emergency. So I took her to the cath lab. So we give them thrombolytics, but uh, we don't give them systemic thrombolytics. Uh, that is what they call it, catheter-based thrombolysis. 
uh, that's our protocol. So just uh, get access from the right femoral vein, go up through the uh, RA, RV, RV outflow. This is the pulmonary artery. So if you see there are two catheters here, here there is one infusion catheter for the thrombolytics for the TPA. And there is another catheter here, we call it ECOS catheter. That's what we are using. This is ultrasound uh, catheters. These ductings are ultrasound. So they emit energy, the thrombus. So the idea is it helps break the thrombus and also it pushes the TPA to the thrombus. So you have a good chance of resolving the thrombus. So uh, put in these two catheters, uh, it's big sheets. The normal catheter we use for heart cut is six French. For this, we use 12 French uh, femoral vein access. So um, we, I gave uh, 2.5 milligram of TPA on this catheter, 2.5 on this catheter on the left bolus, and then infusion one milligram infusion for six hours. Uh, and uh, after six hours, we pull out the catheters. Actually, the patient improved significantly, her shortness of breath resolved, and I'm gonna show you, this is the post uh, echoes, uh, echo, and uh, you can see this is the RV, and uh, actually the ratio was down to 1.2. Of course, over the days it's gonna improve. Uh, so this is one way of treating with thrombolytics, but locally to reduce the complications of uh, intracranial hemorrhage by giving very small dose of TPA in the local thrombus. So with that, I'm gonna accept some questions. Um, uh, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anok. As you guys uh, type in your, um, your questions. I think uh, the this last uh, issue Dr. Henock raised in terms of um, thrombolytics in pulmonary embolus is actually a, a very uh, current um, care in many hospitals that you you need to have uh, um, you know a group of individuals dedicated to the treatment of this pathology. And actually, there has to be almost an acute response kind of thing that's going to be available to not only receive them, but also do the echo, make the diagnosis. So you have to have a guideline and a standard where everybody agrees uh, the kind of patient that needs to be treated and everybody has to be also familiar with uh, placement of the scatters and infusion of the, the medication. So this is not only a cardiologist area, but it's also now an interventional radiologist can do this and also vascular surgeons can do this. And it's really a matter of having a good multidisciplinary uh, team uh, that agrees with the principle which patients you know, need uh, this treatment versus just a plain or uh, anticoagulation. But I think as Dr. Henock said, that the science of strain is really important and critical uh, to make that call. Okay, so, so let's see uh, some questions. Uh, do we routinely give thrombolytics for patients with PE and RV strains without hypotension? So again, this comes back to the criteria. So do you have those criteria? Can you go over that one more time? Yeah, so, okay. So when you have patient with PE, you have to do the risk stratification. The high risk, the intermediate risk, the low risk. The high risk, these patients have the massive PE, saddle PE in the main pulmonary artery or bilateral, they present with hypoxia, hypotension, hemodynamic instability. Those patients, you got, you got to give them thrombolytics, no doubt about that. The low risk are, you know, we have thrombus maybe in one branch of the branch of the pulmonary, either the right or the left pulmonary artery, small, they don't have RV strain. Those patients, you can treat them only with anticoagulation, either unfractionated heparin uh, or, you know, fractionated heparin. The intermediate ones are the one which are tricky. These are patients, uh, they don't have hemodynamic instability, but when you do echo, they have RV strain. And you can add one biomarker. If they have elevated BNP or elevated troponin, those patients, you have to give them thrombolytics. So that's good guide for the intermediate risk. If you have RV strain, you can give them thrombolytics. 
So there are a couple of other questions. Uh, one is on the 250 joule used to cardiovert the atrial flutter case. The question is, in, uh, was this the first or a repeat dose? Um, because it was said to be, very, uh, they respond to a low dose energy. So do you know if this was one initial dose or is this a repeat dose? Um, yeah, and then so... you, can, you can also maybe answer the following question together, which is, in case of emergency cardioversion with atrial fibrillation that comes in shock, how much is the risk of embolization? Okay, so you, you are, um, uh, you know, correct, you can start with 200 joules, uh, um, uh, you know, some people, they go directly to 300 joules, they don't want to repeat the cardioversion, so it's your preference, but you, you can start with small, uh, you know, lower dose and try to cardio over them. If it doesn't work, you have to repeat it. But on this case, we go to 250 and we got it on the first go. Uh, in terms of uh, emergency cardio version with AFib, so if you have AFib um, and hemodynamic instability, you know, hypotension, blood pressure less than 90 in heart failure, those patients, usually we have some time to do uh, TEE, but then if they are hypotensive and in shock at the end of the day, there is no point doing the T, you have to go and cardiovert them. It's not only for AFib, any unstable electrical activity, whether it's AFib, f or, you know, uh, SVT or VT, it's, you have to shock them and get them out of there. Uh, but uh, uh, the risk of embolization, you know, I haven't seen so far, uh, I suspect it's below 5%, but it's still there. So you didn't see them so far because you echo all of them or you didn't have patients that you needed to do an emergency cardioversion because they had been shot? Yeah, most of the time, you know, uh, these patients, we control their heart rate with medications. There are very few that we need to check them. I have a couple of them that I do. If it's emergency, then you don't have any other option. Uh, so don't do the go ahead and cardio versa. So the next question is, you know, is there a specific um, common arrhythmia related with myxoma? That's one. But my question there is also, I mean, you did this echo on this person. Is that an echo because you couldn't figure out what was going on or is, or do you do echoes on everybody that comes with chest pains? Oh, every patient with chest pain and palpitations uh, gets echo, no doubt about that. And uh, um, actually, on this patient, um, are, are you talking about the myxoma? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you would be surprised. So what happened was, uh, they did CT abdomen and the radiologist, he said, well, I don't know what's going on in the chest. So he did, he did, uh, you know, cat scan of the abdomen, but when they cut, I think they went a little bit up in the chest. So they saw something that was suspicious. That's why we ended up doing echocardiogram actually. But in general, you do echoes if they come with chest pain anyway. Every person with chest pain, shortness of breath gets echocardiogram, no doubt about it. Yeah, and so is there any specific arrhythmia related to myxomas that, you know? Well, what? if I have to pick up, you know, this thing acts like mitral stenosis. If you have, it's going to be atrial fibrillation. Basically, it's atrial fibrillation if you have any arrhythmia. And, uh, yeah, and then one other question is, you know, how do we approach atrial fibrillation with left bundle branch block? Um, do we, you know, treat them as, you know, um, as the, uh, if, uh, you know, like the ventricular response or as SVT or are they no, no. approached so, at a wide complex tachycardia? No, no. So this is, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, FIB with left bundle branch block. It's supraventricular. Uh, we treat them like any other FIB, but if patients have left bundle branch block, most of the time they have structural uh, disease, whether dilated cardiomyopathy or coronary artery disease. So we work them up, actually, these patients. Uh, sometimes when they have low AF, of course, they end up uh, having uh, 
uh, coronary angiogram and see if they have ischemic heart disease and then go from there. Now, if you have FE, low EF, dilated cardiomyopathy, non-ischemic, EF less than 35%, of course, those patients, they're going to need ICD defibrillator and uh, what have you. And most of the time, they end up having biventricular pressure to correct the left bundle. So can you um, also touch a little bit about ablation in atrial fibrillation? So yeah, so it looks like, you know, because I gathered from the audience last time they were interested on this type of interaction. Actually, I haven't presented <laughs> my atrial fibrillation yet, uh, but I can give you the ablation uh, thing I have. Uh, you have like. just one slide. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, and so, also the indications, uh, if you can just mention a little okay. bit about the indications. So let me see here if I can. Okay, so um, the approach, general approach to atrial fibrillation is there is rate control, resume control, anticoagulation, ablation, and device. So those are the general. So the rate control basically is you have to give them uh, avionodal blocking agents like uh, either metoprolol, cardizem, digoxin, amiodarone. So when you, okay, so let me go here, uh, actually. Uh, so, um, okay, so rate control, rhythm control, anticoagulation, FE ablation, AV nodal ablation plus pacemaker. So the rate control basically is you blocking the AV node. So you are not doing anything to the FE in the atrium, basically. Rate control is you block the AV node, either with beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, digoxin, amiodarone, and you are controlling the ventricular rate, okay? Of course, they need anticoagulation. The reason control is where you convert the FE into normal sinus rhythm. We call it reason control by cardioversion, chemical, or, you know, electrical. Uh, and the anticoagulation, any patient uh, with FE, they need anticoagulation. So when you do um, um, anticoagulation, let me go here. I have to show you this one. Uh, okay, so when we do anticoagulation, we have metrics, we use what you call a CHAD score. The CHAD score, it calculates the risk of stroke. Basically, it's a metric. So you put, if you have congestive heart failure, it gives them one, hypertension, diabetes, uh, stroke, any vascular disease, age, you put this number. So if the child score is two and above, these patients have increased risk of stroke. So you have to anticoagulate them, either with comedin or the NOAX. If your child score is one or less than two, you can get away only with aspirin. The reason for that is, look at this chart. So when your child score is six, you have 18% risk of stroke. So you have to use the child score to, to anticoagulate these this patients. Now, to the ablation, um, if you cannot control the heart rate with medication, if you cannot control the heart rate with cardioversion, or there are some patients you do cardioversion, they have recurrence of FE, then you can consider ablation. There are two types of ablation in FE. One is to ablate the FE, which is not easy, but there are some uh, patient population, they have high success rate of to ablate the AFib by itself. If you cannot AFib, the, uh, ablate the AFib, then there is what we call it avionodal ablation. Basically, you disconnect the atrium and ventricle as the avionode. So I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, I have uh, one slide here, actually, I was to talk, uh, okay, okay. So let me go to this one first. So, so there are two ablations. One is especially patients with paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation. It's presumed the origin of the AFib is around the pulmonary vein. So there is what we call it pulmonary vein isolation and ablation. Basically, they go is catheter and they disconnect the re-entry and uh, around the pulmonary vein. This is what we call it pulmonary vein isolation and ablation for uh, FE. But the other ablation is, so you have FE here in the atrium. So just 
you go and knock out this AV node. Basically, you are disconnecting electrically the atrium from the ventricle. By doing that, you are creating complete heart block. So these patients, you have to put in pacemaker and do the ablation. So those are the two ablations we use. Either avinodal ablation, you have to put in pacemaker, or pulmonary vein isolation and ablation, and uh, patients can carry over to science reason. Thank you, Enoch. I think uh, this gives a little bit of, uh, of course, it doesn't do a huge service because this is a very complex topic. Uh, it's not as simple as it looks on the pictures, but that said, I think uh, we have uh, probably covered most of what needs to be covered. And I am not sure for if Dr. Tesfaye is on the line or uh, if Dr. Mikias is on the line. If you want, you guys have any comments, that would be great. Is any one of you there or are you working? <laughs> I think, you know, we spent much time on the case. I thought that was uh, yeah, this interesting, is great. but this is, we, we, yeah. we can come back and talk about atrial fibrillation. Uh, yeah. the so there's a question here. It says, if a patient develops embolic stroke despite adequate anticoagulation with warfarin, you know, what do you do? Okay, so uh, one of the things that I didn't talk is... Uh, Probably, uh, I don't know if one of my colleagues says, uh, so one of the things we do is, uh, let me show you here. So now there are some patients, you cannot anticoagulate them, they have risk of bleeding. Some of them, they may have intracranial bleed. So there is what we call it now, a new device, Washman device, basically occluding the left atrial appendage. It's a complicated procedure, transeptal, he came in and he occluded this left atrial appendage. Some other option is when patients go for surgery for any type of you know, cardiac surgery, the surgeons they can do and uh, close like the left atrium also. So, so I, I think the question is probably if during the procedure, you know, you end up, um, you end up with a stroke. With an yeah, so stroke. You, yeah, so you know, it depends. You have to continue anticoagulation. Uh, sometimes, you know, if uh, these are in the big vessels that you can, uh, you know, retrieve them, uh, there is also now, you know, a catheter uh, retraction of clot from uh, the carotids or inside uh, the yeah. cerebral arteries. Yeah, so there are a lot of uh, new gadgets actually with, uh, for clot removal. There are um, catheters that are, you know, almost um, to bring out clots from the, from the um, cerebral circulation where you can go to wherever that clot is and imagine a corkscrew, right? So a corkscrew to get corks out of a uh, um, the bottle, yeah, when in the McFutter, the when thermos cork. The same way, um, there is this kind of a corkscrew catheters that basically gets into the clot, and uh, they will just retrieve it back into into a catheter and remove it. Uh, there are also some suction cups that is being used to retrieve actually catheters, larger catheters, particularly from the pulmonary arteries. Uh, in big, um, in large PEs. Um, there's a 20 French system okay, that's being used, but those kind of patients have to also go on, uh, particularly for the pulmonary embolism part, they have to go on uh, temporary cardiopulmonary bypass as well. So it's really a very uh, complicated uh, procedure, but you can retrieve um, huge amount of clots and uh, uh, thereby, you know, avoid an open uh, heart surgery to remove these clots. But the cerebral clots, you have to really have neurointerventional capa capability in your institution to chase those clots and remove them. Sometimes uh, thrombolysis was directed with catheters into the internal carotid artery also, of course, works. Uh, but those are the techniques. Yeah. Any so other questions? Maybe last comment? Yeah, so to add what Dr. Grima was saying, uh, one of the other um, options for PE, massive PE, is surgical embolectomy. There are very rare patients that we send also 
for open heart surgery and you know uh, surgical embolectomy of uh, the thrombus from the pulmonary artery. Yes, it's called the Chamberlain procedure. So maybe it's worth for you guys to read it, and you know, in the books, uh, it's uh, at this point it's becoming more and more of a historic uh, uh, value. Uh, probably in our institution over the past ten years, there might have been maybe one a year, uh, but those are things that happen when patients are in the hospital um, and uh, experience this massive post-surgical you know, pulmonary emboli, uh, and you have to have almost everything ready to do this so that you can just go to the OR and, and do this open embolectomy. But it, it's really um, not a very common practice. So that said, I think uh, uh, we will look forward to the um, uh, scheduled talk on Friday by Dr. Mikias, who is going to go over uh, the fundamentals about TE, and he's uh, probably going to give us a lot of um, um, case uh, presentations to make you familiar with some of the transthoracic and uh, transesophageal echoes. Uh, we will do the structural um, uh, cardiac um, talk that Dr. Tesfai was trying to give you. Uh, last week uh, or when we were on Monday. I think we're going to do that uh, next Monday uh, so that you can really break it down and um, spend some time to go over what constitutes, uh, you know, uh, structural abnormalities and how all that ties in into a multidisciplinary approach in terms of treatment. So we will do that um, next week, Monday. And next week, Wednesday, I'm convinced now that I think the peripheral vascular piece also ties with this. So Dr. Henock has convinced me to give a talk on peripheral vascular disease. So I just try to kind of bring that to your attention as well, because particularly in countries like Ethiopia and the rest of Africa, where diabetes is rampant uh, and hypertension is so severe, um, there is a lot of untreated vascular diseases. Uh, so I think uh, bringing uh, a presentation on uh, peripheral vascular disease makes sense. And next week, Friday, we'll conclude um, our cardiology uh, series with uh, a panel uh, discussion. So, so um, we're looking forward to seeing you this Friday for the ECHO, and then we'll continue next week and end up um, doing our series here by the end of uh, next week, Friday, and then we'll move on to other topics uh, that are going to include um, uh, infectious disease uh, topics to, follow, to be followed by um, some pediatrics as well as some uh, colorectal pathologies, uh, benign and malignant, um, and so, so, so that we can keep a little bit more of a, a neutral ground and a wider kind of application. So with that, we'll see you next time. Thank you for attending and for your nice participation. And thank you, Dr. Henock, for a wonderful presentation. Okay, thank you.